I am really excited to kick off our semester's uh, academic programming with Dr. Tricia Starks, uh, who is a distinguished professor of history at the University of Arkansas and also affiliated with CREASE as one of our Great Plains fellows, a program that extends across the Great Plains region. Uh, and I want to I want to thank Dr. Starks for joining us uh, here at KU, and also thank uh, Ezra Predilots, uh, Megan Luttrell, and Maria Barisova for all their help in in making this visit possible. Uh, Dr. Starks has been at Arkansas since 2000. She received her PhD in history from Ohio State University, so she's been at Arkansas since then, uh, in, embarking on a really successful and productive career. Uh, that, that examines the intersection of culture and public health in Russia and the Soviet Union, but also does so increasingly in a more global context. Uh, she is the author of three, three really interesting books. Uh, the Body Soviet, which was published by the University of Wisconsin Press in 2008. Smoking Under the Czars, which came out from Cornell in 2018. And Cigarettes and Soviets, which was published by Northern Illinois in 2022. And in addition to that really impressive uh, publication record, she's also the co-editor of several collections, including most recently uh, one of my favoritely titled books, uh, From Fish Guts to Fabergé, The Life Cycle of Russian <laughs> Things, which came out, I guess, in between her two most recent books. Uh, so she has a very productive record. Uh, her most recent book, Cigarettes and the Soviets, which inspires her talk today, uh, was shortlisted for the Pushkin House Prize and received a lot of praise from both journals in our field and from public health journals for making contributions both to the literature on global public health but also to the particular and perhaps peculiar history of public health inside the USSR. Starks is a, a compelling writer but also makes great use of, of visual images and, and uses visual analysis in her work. Um, I read from her website that she's working on a new project, which I think will build on her successes uh, examining the anxieties around male health and vigor during the Soviet period into the present day. Um, so she, she's really doing fascinating research. And in addition to her publications, she's received grants from the National Institutes of Health, as well as the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies. And in addition to doing all of that stuff and teaching, um, she's also the director of the University of Arkansas's Humanities Center. In her talk today, uh, Starks will talk about uh, the, the rise of tobacco use in a, in a global context, focusing on the Soviet Union, a place where advertising, product manipulation, industrial design was perhaps less developed, but smoking was still completely rampant. And so she'll look at both the use of, of tobacco and the fight against it in this both communist and capitalist perspective. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tricia Starks. Well, oh, good, it's on. Well, thank you. Can you travel with me? Um, that was lovely. What a lovely introduction. And just you are all so lucky to be at a place that has a center like this. At Ohio State, we had a center. It just brings such invigorating programming, exciting people. Um, it has just been lovely to be here, to be around Slavicists and be able to exchange ideas and talk with people who, well, who understand what you're talking about and understand the language that you're speaking. So thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Um, I uh, come to you today with, oops, with a problem. First, it's the clicker. Um, I come to you today with a problem, and it's the large amount of smoking that takes place in Russia, the areas of the foreign Russian, uh, the former Russian Empire, and in areas of Eastern Europe. Global tobacco use is still a problem. One in four adults in the world smoke. And it may seem like it's not that big a problem to you, but when you think about what that means in terms of health, well, long-term tobacco use kills 50% of its users in some way or form. And so that is a big problem for Russia and the former Soviet Union. If you look at these percentages of smokers, this is much higher than you deal with in the United States. The United States right now, male smoking is about 15% prevalence, female smoking about 13%. But if you look at areas of Russia 
and its former environs. If you look at high levels, especially in Georgia, in Belarus, in Ukraine, you're seeing large numbers of people smoking, especially men, and you see from that large numbers of death. If you put a rough estimate of 500,000 deaths a year for areas of the former Soviet Union, you're talking about 50 million deaths over the course of the 20th century. I once told students what I do. I, I study the history of cigarettes, and they're like, oh, that seems like such a minor deal. But 50, de or 50 million deaths is a large issue to think about. And these are not easy deaths. I'm going to talk a lot about the beauty of smoking. I love smoking. I miss it. I'm looking at Kurt, because Kurt and I both miss smoking. I miss smoking. But the sensual appeals of smoking are nothing compared to the terrors and agonies of the deaths from smoking. The cancers that eat away at you, the cancers that envelop the entire body and bring with them extreme pain and decay and problems. Not just for you, but for those around you that have to experience that death and watch that death. And so, I may talk a lot about beauty today, but I want you to remember two things, if nothing else. 50% will die from a smoking-related illness if they do use tobacco in long term. And it's incredibly hard to quit if you start. Only 5% of people are able to quit on any one attempt when, they have had, when they've been smoking. That's without any kinds of AIDS, but most of the AIDS are not that great. So, don't start, kids, and realize that it's a death sentence for most of you if you do. So we're going to start with that problem. And that problem has been interpreted largely by Western historians who have looked at tobacco use and seen tobacco use as something that is from capitalism. They talk about it as reasons that people smoke as part of capitalism. I'm going to tell you a bit about what those Western histories say. And then we're going to turn to the Soviet Union and go, what? And talk about the questions that raises about why people smoke in the Soviet Union. How do they keep on smoking? What is that enigma that I'll call it? Because they smoke, and they smoke a lot. They smoke much higher percentages than we see in the West. And so if it's capitalism, why do people smoke in a communist system? And once I get done with that and telling you why they smoke, we'll talk a little bit about what that means for the future of cessation. That's the idea of how do we quit smoking, how do we help other people quit smoking. And then we'll talk about that also in terms of Putin's appeal in my next project. And so what this has to do with men's health. So, we got our map. We're going to do about 40, 45 minutes on this. Take us over the course of the 20th century. I've got lovely visual aids. It's a tobacco-free campus, though, so please do not smoke my visual aids. And then we'll have time for questions. Do you have samples? I have samples. Don't you? They're old, too. These are like 20-year-old cigarettes, which is not something anyone would smoke, except we did. <laughs> so, all right. Western histories. So Western histories have approached to the tobacco problem in multiple ways. One of our first ones, I'm going to have slides like this throughout that have little uh, um, kind of visual footnotes for you. If you like tobacco, like I do, you might want to be able to read about it. And here's some of your examples for you. So John Burnham in 1992 wrote this lovely book on the left, Bad Habits. Drinking, smoking, taking drugs, gambling, sexual misbehavior, and swearing in American history. Um, John Burnham makes the argument that smoking is largely a bad habit, a vice, something that is a moral choice, something that people do out of bad habits, out of bad behavior, out of bad moral um, fiber. And therefore, he minimizes it. He makes it something that's up to individuals that it makes it an individual choice. I don't think any of you will be surprised to know that he was funded by the tobacco industry. You might be surprised to know. <laughs> we knew John Burnham. He was funded by the tobacco industry. And this is exactly what the tobacco industry has always said, that it's people's individual choices. But in 1998, as part of discovery with a massive lawsuit called the Master Settlement, 
the tobacco giants had to reveal the documents of their industry. And historians dove in. And they found there the stories that we see from these other people. Alan Brandt's Pulitzer Prize winning piece talks about the allure of cigarettes that was used with advertising. How they drew people in, especially young people, and got them hooked early. Robert Proctor, famous German historian, goes in his Golden Holocaust, which talks about the 100 billion deaths over the course of the 20th century globally from tobacco. He talks about how manufacturers designed cigarettes to be more addictive, how they actually didn't just try and lure you in with marketing, that they tried to make these things items you couldn't walk away from. He expands upon that in his Packaged Pleasures to say that they put together packaging and industrial design to make cigarettes something you couldn't put down. It all culminates in Courtright's book where he describes what he calls limbic capitalism, which is an amazing term. How basically capitalists learn how to turn on your lizard brain without you ever being party to it. To create addiction without you making individual choices. So we've spanned from individual choice all the way to lizard brain. Overall, these guys, and there are many others, they talk about major parts of addiction coming from marketing, packaging, design, and supply. In terms of marketing, tobacco manufacturers are at the forefront. They are pioneers in the use of color. They are pioneers in alternative advertising. Um, they use skywriters early on. They use people walking around in sandwich boards early on in the early 1920s. They actually have a smoking billboard on Times Square of a guy that would puff out smoke rings in the late 1920s and early 1930s, pioneers in electric light, pioneers also in celebrity endorsements. Here are nice, he looks like he's doing actually an underground or underhand softball pitch, but pioneers in celebrity endorsements, pioneers in movie placement, pioneers in all sorts of alternative marketing. But mostly that marketing is selling sex, blow some my way, or pleasure, the idea of the good life, what uh, one historian of advertising has called capitalist realism for all of my Slavicists out there, the idea that it is your life lived better with the product, just like socialist realize, realism is your life lived better with the ideology. They are pioneers in marketing. They are, oops. They are also spending huge amounts on it, flooding the system with marketing of their products. This is from um, Goodman's Tobacco in History. It has a lot of information on how much money they spend on tobacco, and you can see the expansion of it. Especially you see it after 1964, which is when the US Surgeon General's report comes out saying that tobacco causes lung cancer. Look at how much more money they spend after that point. And so Brandt's argument that marketing is important, you can see where he might get that. Packaging goes hand in hand with marketing. Oh, and here's my first visual aid. Not only, not only are they pioneers in marketing, they are pioneers in packaging in designing packaging that is seductive. Now, this guy over here, Empire of the Senses by David Howes, talks about how capitalists use packaging to seduce the senses. And the example he has in his book is probably more familiar to most people who don't smoke anymore. More familiar is the sound of a woman's lipstick when it closes. And every woman in the room knows that a Dior lipstick sounds very different than a cover girl. It's a soft clip. It is just the sound of luxury. It's the sound of expensive. 
And tobacco manufacturers are up there in terms of doing that same thing, of giving you the idea of luxury and beauty in your product. They pioneer cellophane in the 1930s to wrap around your box, and so the camel locks going around has that cellophane. They pioneer foil inserts. Both of these things help to keep the burn of the cigarette correct by keeping the moisture contact, uh, content at the right level, but they also make every cigarette pack a package of 20 gifts that you open up. Every time you open a new package of cigarettes, it's like, it's like a little Christmas morning. You snap that uh, mylar, you open that red twist, and there are those beautiful white, bright cigarettes in that paper. These ideas are are researched to within an inch of their life. The rebranding of Lucky Strike in 1940 is one example. With Lucky Strike, they do research. Women prefer pastels. Men prefer dark tints. They redo the Lucky Strike box to incorporate both bright whites and dark, bold colors to get both men and women hooked on their box before they even pull out the cigarette. What amazingly, I mean, come on, you're sitting there going, I had no idea they had so much deceptive ideas within their tobacco. Yes, they did. So much thought and marketing strategy and research and going through focus groups over and over to see how they could build desire. But that's not enough. They also design their products in terms of industrial design. So the smell and taste of burning nicotine is that of burning rubber. No person is going to do that twice. Cigarette manufacturers look for ways to cover that with flavors, with florals, rose and chrysanthemum, with woods, sassafras, maple, with fruits, cherry, with um, aromatics like cinnamon or clove cigarette. You may have heard of a clove cigarette. They use those to cover up that scent. And at the same time, it increases addictive response. Sugars increase our, our interest in having more tobacco. Menthol numbs the throat, even as it adds mint. So it stops the irritation from the tobacco and makes you want more. My favorite, they add ammonia. Ammonia makes tobacco use like freebasing, increasing the bioavailability of nicotine. They make more addictive products within these addictive packages, with these addictive visuals, to create a capitalist dependency. The final figure that is seen as important especially by Courtright and his age of addiction, is about supply. And this is where American tobacco manufacturers are at the forefront. The best hand rollers in the world, and they are the Slavs. The women of Eastern Europe are so good at this, they, in, they import East European women into Virginia as the first tobacco rollers. Duke is like, until they until they start to organize unions and become a rather problematic force. I think, I think we're none of us surprised at that either. They import um, East European tobacco rollers because they can do four cigarettes in a minute, faster than anyone in the world, except when he starts with his Bonzac machine. After the women become obstreperous, he starts to look for machinery that can do the job better. The Bonzac machine can roll 200 cigarettes in one minute, blowing those women out of the water. And also creating a huge supply, which is why he does a huge amount of advertising, which is why he starts to push it on the American public, trying to get more people to smoke because he has a massive supply and now it's really cheap. He vertically integrates, he does all sorts of things. He is a business titan. All of this is amazing, right? You, you may not have thought about it, this is it. but this is a story of how we create capitalist problems and capitalist, what the hell? How do we explain this in the Soviet Union? 
because there is that problematic Bolshevik revolution in October 1917, which creates an entirely new system of marketing, of consumption, of relationships to design and advertising. How do you explain this in an area without any of the incentives that are seen as integral to capitalism? Not only are there no incentives, there are actually disincentives in the Soviet system to smoking. The Soviets enter World War I in a, um, well, the Russians enter World War I in a system of prohibition, having alcohol as a prohibited substance, as um, Phillips and Tranchel talk about. And they include in those things that they see as clouding consciousness, tobacco. Um, Tolstoy talks about how tobacco takes away your moral feeling. And he's not alone. Henry Ford refers to um, cigarettes as the little white slaver, which is the title of this book over here on the bottom, about tobacco use in the United States and attempts to stamp it out. They are entering the war already interested in cutting down on items that cloud consciousness that are addictive like alcohol. This is aided by the fact that they create in 1918 the first national health service in the world, headed by N.A. Semeshko. Semeshko is an ardent anti-smoker. And he's joined by Lenin, who also hates tobacco. And so you have the two leaders, the leader of the health service and the leader of the government, both exceedingly anti-smoking. And they will start in 1920 the world's first anti-tobacco campaign at the national level. They will put out their own advertisements, such as this nice little poster from 1927 or so. Um, it's a Mayakovsky slogan, quit your smoking, it's paper wrap poison. It's as close of a rhyme as I could get. <laughs> um, they have advertisements, they have booklets, they have posters. They start cessation clinics in 1927 where they have people clamoring to come in and learn how to quit smoking. It is a huge campaign. And it continues through the 1930s. Even as Stalin is a smoker, they have anti-smoking messaging. It's largely for women and children, but it's still out there. It continues onward. This one's lovely, isn't it? What a beautiful poster. Continued through the 1960s. And there's that Mayakovsky slogan again, into the 1970s. A huge anti-tobacco campaign, massive disincentives. How the heck? What about these other things that we associate with tobacco? Well. One thing that's going on is that they have a lot of smokers. They have more smokers in the world than anywhere else earlier. And here's the book on that one. By 1914, I argue that Russia is the world's first mass smoking society. More smokers, according to contemporary reports, the average urban male is smoking a pack a day by the beginning of World War I. Massive amounts of smoking. And I'm not alone. There's this guy from 1898 in an anti-tobacco pamphlet who says, the number of smokers in Russia is 10 to 20 times greater than the number of people in alcoholic excess. And we all know that Russia has a certain relationship with alcohol, according to contemporary observers. To say that smoking is even more intense is to put it well ahead of any other society. I lost my clicker. Where to go? There it is. Because smoking is just one way of taking tobacco. But if you look at it, 
Russia, by 1914, 50% of their tobacco is going into cigarettes. In the same point, at the same year, 1914, in the United States, only 7% is going into cigarettes. And you may say, well, what, what the hell? What, what does that matter? Tobacco use has many ways that you can have it. You can snuff. You can do pipes. You can do um, chaw. You can, uh, what else? The nargil. You can, um, they actually have fumigating enemas at a certain point. I would not recommend. Um, they have all sorts of ways that one can take tobacco. But when you take it in in a cigarette, you are taking it in in the most addictive response rate possible. Because when you inhale tobacco, unlike with a pipe where it goes through the mouth lining, it takes a long time for that to go into the system. When you inhale tobacco, 90% of the nicotine goes through your body within 30 seconds. If you add in that ammonia additive I was talking about, you freebase the tobacco so that you are actually getting a high from the tobacco. So when you smoke, you are creating the most addictive situation possible. And so the fact that Russia has so much of their tobacco going into cigarettes makes them more prone to addictive behavior and addictive response. Now, I have been saying cigarettes, I must confess, they're not really cigarettes. They are a peculiar Russian thing. These are some um, newer manufacturers of an old style. Bogatir. Woo! <laughs> you can have a look. They are called peperosi. They have a cardboard gilza and a small kurka filled with tobacco. Here, take my beauties. Be kind to them. I also have some. These are, uh, these are Soviet manufacturers. They're not as nice. They're Bella Moore Canal, just for you. They don't have a filter, but you can create a filter by closing up that cardboard tube. You can pinch it. Uh, that's not a filter. But that's what they say, is you can create that. So here's some that you can manu uh, manhandle a bit, if you wish. That peperosa is peculiar to Russia. That peperosa is more addictive. That peperosa is often also filled with a special kind of tobacco called mohorka. It's nicotiana rustica. Nicotiana tobacco is what we mostly smoke here in the United States. Rustica is what Raleigh brought over. It is so intensely nicotine heavy, it is twice as nicotine heavy as most tobaccos. It can even cause hallucinogenic response. So they are smoking a more addictive behavior and they're smoking something that's much more addictive because of the nicotine content. All right, so they got a bit of a problem going into 14. So we do have these disincentives. This should be stopping people from smoking, but what else is going on? We do have some marketing. Oh wait, new visual aid. Lots of pretty pictures in here. In the 1920s, we do have a small little tasty bit of capitalism allowed. We do have some manufacturers who have advertising. Tobacco, though, is a, a state concern. Tobacco is a nationalized system in the Soviet system. And we do have a bit of marketing. It is very small scale. It's gorgeous. Please love the marketing pictures. But it is very small scale. Paper is in short supply. Ink is in short supply. There's not a lot going on in terms of marketing. But it is gorgeous, isn't it? And it uses the same triumvirate. Start having cigarettes enjoyed by soldier workers and peasant altogether. You see that in both of the posters. You start to see this kind of attempt to revolutionize tobacco. But that's really just a reflection of what's going on. Because revolutionaries smoke. We know this. John Reed, when he's talking about 10 days that shook the world, talks about how every meeting is just a cloud of cigarette smoke. Um, Tolstoy, or Tolstoy, Trotsky, in his essay on the problems of life, in his Milici Beat, he talks about cigarette butts as being the sign of the uncultured. They're everywhere. 
And so the ad marketing isn't really the thing that's turning. Okay, so marketing isn't working for us. That's part of the cap. What about boxes and packaging? Oh, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Boxes and packaging are going out there. More, see, here's your Bellamore canal. Oops, sorry. Boxes and packaging is in rough cardboard. It's nothing compared. You touched all of those things earlier. You touched those camels and those Marlboros and their beautiful flip top. It's nowhere near the same. Low grade paper, the, the Bellamore Canal and the little um, cloisonne box, or the little um, paper mache box, what are those called? Uh, lacquer box, there we go. Those little lacquer box, you can see the quality of the paper is so low. And the same is true of the packaging. They try and make it revolutionary. This one is Worker Peasant Alliance. It has worker on one side, peasant on the other, both of them in the, the idea of construction. It's got all of this political messaging in it, but it is nowhere near the seductive capability of the West. We have sex cells with Priyatnia, or manliness in Kavkaskia. <laughs> I don't even know what's going on in Christianski. <laughs> Ah, that's true. <laughs> we have all sorts of marketing, but it's just not nearly the level. Is this enough to make you want to inhale that burned rubber over and over again? Is this enough to make you want to go past that aversion of the first cigarette? Two of the most, the most famous brands, Bellamore Canal and Kazbek, come out in the 1930s. These are there for the entire Soviet period, and the boxes that I handed around to you are about the same quality throughout the entire Soviet period. The map changes, actually, on the Bellamore Canal. You can look it up. It just slowly changes over the course of the Soviet period. But uh, there's not a lot of product innovation. What about design? Oh, wait. Let's see. Does it stop people from smoking? Not according to our, uh, our um, surveys from the late 1920s. Here, from 1926 to 27, worker use. The Medical Institute is a really sad commentary right there. A lot of smokers. Railway workers, males and females, high smoking by the late 1920s. None of this is stopping them from smoking. None of this is anywhere near what the capitalists are doing, and it still isn't stopping people from smoking. Something else has got to be going on, right? What about design? Not there either. Because in industrial design in Soviet tobacco, we have one of the foremost experts on flavoring and tasting, a man named A. A. Schmuck. Schmuck's papers are actually in the, the master settlement. The um, Western tobacco manufacturers are researching Schmuck because he's like at the forefront. Schmuck's entire life as a researcher is on how to try and make tobacco healthier how to get rid of the nicotine levels, how to try and get people to smoke something else. He, he experiments with all sorts of leaves, poplar leaves, birch leaves, maple leaves, anything to try and get people to stop or to smoke something less dangerous. And we see all sorts of experimentation by Soviet manufacturers in trying to make things that are less dangerous, less nicotine, anti-nicotine, um, anti uh, those filters, sometimes you could put like batting in the, um, the um, gilza, the cardboard part, and that would be your filter. So they even voluntarily put on their um, anti-smoking messages. They actually are trying to get people to stop. And indeed, I, I interviewed the guy that was in charge of Yava when this um, label came out, foremost uh, tobacco factory in the Soviet Union. He said, we, we didn't market because we couldn't even supply the people that wanted tobacco. Why would we want to create demand and just make people angry? Because we couldn't supply them with what they wanted. And indeed, that's our last question. What about supply? If that's part of this, this idea of how capitalism makes people smokers, what's going on with supply? Not great. I know you're shocked, shocked to hear that Soviet products might have been low in quality and in number. But indeed, tobacco was low in quality and in number. And 
they don't even have machine rolling really reliably until after World War II. They start to have some machine rolling in the late 1920s. They only get up to pre-World pre War I levels by 27, like most of the country. They're pretty late from World War I recovery. 1930s, they can't keep up. There's complaints in the press about dirt in the tobacco, rocks in the tobacco. They don't have enough um, cigarettes in the pack. It's just a mess. And World War II comes along, and it gets worse because the fields are war are the fields of tobacco. Ukraine is like the major source of Soviet tobacco, beautiful tobacco fields. Chernigov is a place of Mahorka, oh, good stuff. The areas of the Black Sea, fantastic tobacco manufacture to the point of even having cigar tobacco there. Beautiful stuff. These things are overrun by war. But surprisingly enough, they try and move tobacco factories and that great movement of um, machinery and man in front of the, Soviet, or in front of the Nazi menace they also move like 12 tobacco factories, seeing them as essential to wartime. Struggling to keep with supply, they get to a point during World War II in Leningrad that they actually start smoking the leaves that have fallen on the street and um, taking the resin out of the um, tobacco factory tubes, scraping the tobacco factory smokestacks, mixing that with leaves from the ground and smoking that. As part of that, they actually start smoking at the leaves of the golden rain tree tree, or what is it? Yeah, golden rain tree. They're actually a very close approximation of nicotine, and they find out that this is a great anti-nicotine drug. It's the source of Tabex, which is one of the primary anti-nicotine um, drugs that is used in Europe. Comes out of Bulgarian research and comes out of the necessities of wartime. But what we see is a lack of supply a lack of industrial design, a general lack of packaging, a poor record on marketing. Why else are people smoking? Post-war supply problems become so bad, Soviets can't keep up with their market, they start importing from Bulgaria. Bulgaria will bring in, from 1966 to 1985, Bulgaria is the world's foremost exporter of cigarettes. 90% of their exports go to the Soviet Union. Soviets can't keep up, can't keep up with their own market, can't even keep up with massive imports. They have massive imports um, uh, into Eastern Europe as part of the Marshall Plan. $1 billion of the $13 billion in food aid is cigarettes. They just can't keep up. Does it stop people from smoking? <laughs> I think you already know the answer. People are still smoking. Still smoking in tremendous amounts. Highest that the US ever gets is uh, 1965. I think it's 52% of males are smoking. We leave them in the dust. Soviets smoke in such higher amounts. It is so impressive to Western manufacturers that they're like, how do we get in there? And they start in 1964, Philip Morris starts with <laughs> Operation Red Carpet, according to the internal documents, trying to get into the Soviet market. It's a, prop a propitious year. 1964 is also the year of the Surgeon General report saying that smoking is hazardous to your health. They are intensely interested in trying to find new markets. And the Soviet one seems ripe because they know the Soviets can't keep up. And so Operation Red Carpet leads to mission to Moscow, leads to Apollo Soyuz. Oh, wait. Whee, space cigarettes. Ooh. With a uh, cover design by a cosmonaut who is also a, a, uh, an artist. Philip Morris sends everything to Yava Factory in Moscow, tremendous loss just to try and get their foot in the door. They don't care as long as they can get that foot in the door. The next year, they are able to get Philip Morris marketing to allow Marlboro to be manufactured in the Soviet Union. 
Marlboro is a juggernaut, the leading sales in the entire world for tobacco because it is designed within an inch of its life. It is marketed perfectly. It is one that Soviets market for the system. Here's two stills from movies of the period. Um, from Ivan Vasilevich, there's a point where he turns around singing the song about what, what the good life is like now. And, the and he turns around and he holds out a pack of Marlboro because it's the sign of the good life. And then the cheeky secretary in Slujebny Roman, who uh, talks about how she's smoking Marlboro as on the phone to talk about how wild and crazy and how up to date she is. But most Soviets didn't get a hand on a Marlboro. In terms of supply, it doesn't really make a difference. Most Marlboros in the Soviet period are never opened. They're just passed from one person to the other as a gift, as a token of esteem. But you never open those because they're too valuable to actually smoke. Passed along, esteemed, supply is nothing compared to the marketing that is scarcity, of wanting, of desire for something you can't have. That desire erupts in the late 1980s and into 1990 and 91, when we have cigarette riots that are part of the system falling apart. Philip Morris steps in to help, as do all of the American tobacco manufacturers, sending some 30 billion sticks to the Soviet Union to try and help assuage the crowds. But overall, what we have seen is a story of not tobacco manufacturers in the West, not marketing, packaging, design, and supply, but a, a, a lack of those. So why, how, do we, how do we pursue cessation? How are we better at fighting tobacco when we know that the story is not the same in every system, when we know that it's not just capitalism, that you have to be a student of culture to understand why people smoke and how to stop them from smoking. And this is not just a, an ad for cultural history, but come on, cultural history is important because it answers these questions. And one of the things that I see as an answer is that tobacco has other allures, that there are other things that prompt us to smoke, whether it's camaraderie, whether it's these times that we can have a break from life, whether it's something that is intrinsic to the idea of a scarce resource that gives you pleasure. There are other things that make smoking enjoyable to people. And in the Soviet and Russian experience, one of those things is definitely in, wound up with what it means to be a man because males smoke in such higher numbers. Women smoke a lot too, don't get me wrong, but men smoke in much higher numbers. And we can see a linear progression in that from 19th century ads that make smoking part of manliness and part of a boy's journey into being a man. I can't even tell you how much the archivists love this. All the ladies of the archive came around me with that little boy smoking and thought it was the cutest thing as I was sitting there horrified beyond belief as to what was going on there. <laughs> it's an image that keeps going through the Soviet period with this idea of manliness and smoking put together. This painting by Google on the right showing the young boy doing the exact same thing when they had in the 19th century turning into a man by smoking a cigarette. And yet, male smoking declines dramatically after it reaches a high point in the 1990s. Even as marketing in the Western style emerges, even as packaging in the Western style emerges, tobacco use goes down in Russia. Now, part of this is because a lot of people die. The average age of Russian male death drops into the 50s in 1994, 56.7 years. But part of this also is a changing idea about masculinity that is part of my next project. Ideas about how men should behave, 
how men can be healthier and stronger and vigorous without engaging in alcohol use or tobacco use. It's an image that Putin does a great job of putting forth and has had extreme success in terms of cessation campaigns in alcohol and tobacco use. Alcohol and tobacco use have dropped dramatically since the mid-2005 to 2008 period. Massive declines in both of those, with an increase in the average age of death for men and women, something that the Soviets had been struggling with for a long time that reached its nadir in the 1990s is now being found, is, is now being turned around. And it's, I think, one of the things that Putin is using to put forward as his appeal. That is my story of Russian and Soviet tobacco use and then Russian tobacco abuse again. I think that we can learn from that how to better fight tobacco, how to better live our lives, and also how to interrogate these ideas of what Western concepts are often used to try and paint the rest of the world as the same. That we can't always use the same key for every door. That we have to think outside of that and actually examine difference rather than just assume. So thank you very much. Oh, wait, I also have a bag of Mahorka, if anybody wants to smell it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I have a microphone. If somebody can actually walk that around, because. Right, so please raise your hand, and uh, if you have a question for Dr. she'll be happy to see. And give me my AIDS back. Don't, don't, nobody's walking out with my paparossi. <laughs> um, hi, this was fantastic, by the oh, way. Thank you. Um, did the Soviets, like particularly early on, when they're like really you know anti-smoking, do they ever try and just dismantle the industry, just shut it down? That's an excellent and, question. Like, close the factories. Or? And and uh, there is a point where Semeshko comes in 1920 to the Malisov to the the highest level, and Lenin's like, go ahead and start that fight with tobacco. I'll back you. And then Semeshko goes to the meeting. And Lenin just steps back, and Semeshko just gets destroyed because they argue that the industry is needed at that time to prop up the economy. And we see that same calculus used in the 1930s. Stalin will say, go ahead and increase alcohol production and tobacco production so that we can fund our change. Um, and then by the time, by the 1970s, when they're starting to talk about trying to stop tobacco use, the only argument you get from the industry in the internal documents I've seen is, we just, we're great with slowing down the use of tobacco. Just don't let the people be angry at us that we're not producing enough. They are too worried that if they don't produce enough, they'll have riots. And indeed, we have riots. We have um, anger in the 1970s. We have anger in the 30s, 70s. And then in the 1990s, full on, uh, Leonid Sinilnikov, the guy that heads Yava, has to take an entire group of angry rioters on the floor of Yava to prove that they're actually making cigarettes because the crowd is so angry that they don't have enough. So, but yeah, there's this, how much, how much do you have to produce to keep civil order, even as you're trying to fight this problem. So it's an amazing. We have another question right here. Yeah. Um, Professor Trisha, thank you very much for your great presentation. My name is Igor Lailo. I'm original from Ukraine. So uh, I would like to share you one of the joke from the time when I was born, you know, in this country. I still remember the teacher called for the mother of the bad uh, teenager students and informed this mother, oh, yeah, uh, Mrs. Vasilieva, I have a bad, bad news for you, your son. It looks that your son starts to smoke. And the mother asked, okay, this is only one worse news. No, the another one, she, she smoked only in the time when he a little bit drunk. <laughs> and she said, it's enough or something more? Yeah, it's more information. She smoked and drunk only in a moment when he spent a lot of the money in a legal casino. 
And the answer of the mother was, oh, it looks my son start to be a man. So it's very typical, like kind of the joke, you know, for yeah. the moment when I was teenagers. And the second of my comments is, um, actually, I've never smoked. I'm very proud about this. But mostly of my friends who, who start to smoke made it in the time of the military service or when this guy is back from the prison. Mm -hmm. In uh, Soviet culture, the cigarettes uh, many times just looks like an element of the surviving if you stay in military service in the time of the war or in prison. Mm -hmm. Do you know about these aspects of the culture yeah. of the smokers in the USSR? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's uh, One, love the joke. I actually have a 19th century version of that where it's like, Oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm almost a man, says the little boy in the cartoon, and the girl next to him says, no, you're not. You don't smell like cigarettes yet. And so, I mean, it is that same idea of tobacco being manliness. Um, in terms of the war, it is a formative. It, it's, it's already a part of the formative visuals of tobacco use among Russians. Um, Russian Empire in the 19th century. The story of where the cigarette comes from is that a um, soldier in Crimea in the 1850s, is, um, his pipe breaks, and he can't smoke his pipe. So he takes out a bullet casing. And so bullets, you have bullet packed with um, gunpowder all around a, a piece of muslin or um, um, paper. And so he throws out the cartridge and the, the um, gunpowder packs in the tobacco and smokes that. And so it is already the idea of where cigarettes come from comes from this intrinsic idea of male bonding in the military. And in the 20s, well, in the 19th century and on through the 1920s, they market it heavily. And then if you watch, as I'm sure you have, Soviet film, uh, Chapayev is smoking, Stalin smokes throughout all of the um, cinematic portrayals, and it is seen as what men do. And so that is such a problem to try and fight it. Um, and that's something that comes out in 1968, this demographer by the name of Erlanis comes out and says that smoking and drinking is killing our Russian men. And we need to figure out how to stop it. And everybody gets all upset because they're like, you can't stop smoking and drinking and still be a man. It's just, it's, and it is, it's part of manliness in terms of prison culture. It's part of manliness in terms of the military. It is embedded so deeply that it's hard to figure out how to be a man without it. And, and so that's why Putin being able to be manly and not smoke and drink flips the script. Because Boris, he, 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 he took a little, <laughs> he tippled a bit. So, but an excellent question. And yeah, that's something I'm trying to grapple with this next project, is trying to figure out that connection between manliness and bad behavior. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tricia, for this excellent and engaging talk. That's, that's precisely what I wanted to ask about, is this next project and the n other models of masculinity. So, so just to be clear, like riding shirtless and doing judo, <laughs> Uh, riding horseback, shirtless, and doing judo. You're, you're suggesting that this is a cultural model that's spreading. That there's a, there are new definitions of masculinity that don't involve smoking and drinking. I I, I think you got me on the the early time of this, but I will say that I do think I think Putin has very much tried to market himself as manly and strong. And if you, what's the one? It, it says that he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. Um, this, and I can't remember the year, 2007, something like that. There's this huge pop song. And it's, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he, he doesn't beat. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a horrible song. You must look it up and listen to it, because now it's going through my head for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I just wrote a paper about the, um, his resurrection of the Epiphany ceremony. And that's the one where you go out and jump in the, the icy cold water and how it brings together these ideas of manliness, Russianness, 
healthfulness, because we have the idea of steeliness and zakal that's been from the 19th century onward, but the epiphany waters are seen as particularly healthful. And so he's doing all of these things. In, um, what was it, 2017, he gave a big speech about how he was going to bomb Florida. And he had like the missiles going into Florida. The next like six paragraphs of his speech were all about how he had increased the average age of death. That we were living, we were going to live to age 70. So, I mean, it's been part of his messaging. And I think it is a big turnaround that he's made. Because if you look at him compared to Yeltsin, who was a bumbling fool by the end, but also very visibly unhealthy, or Brezhnev, or for God's sake, Andropov and Chinyenko as they boom, boom, right out, right, one after the other. We have this long history of feebled leaders, and he counters that in that physicality. And I think this is an ongoing message that he is building on that is appealing. Whether, whether this is the only thing, I do think there's a healthification that comes from westernization, that comes from last time I was there, I remember seeing all sorts of gymnasiums and um, yoga mats and all of these other kinds of commodification of health. I think that's also important, but I don't think we can dismiss how Putin is trying to buy into that. And I do think, to a certain extent, like that horrible, horrible song, he is seen as this. And so, but yeah, that's, that's something I have to tease out. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for walking around with the mic. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit about smoking and femininity? I mean, there's this, you know, I know it's more traditional gender norms in Russia and in the Soviet Union and this, I'm very excited about what you're doing right now. Um, <laughs> but you know, like, yeah, I have to get back to would it. women oh. smoke the same cigarettes as men? I think I remember when I was in Russia that they were like, oh, gr yes. girl Slims. cigarettes. And oh yeah, they have a Victoria, uh, yeah. Victoria Slims. Yeah. yeah, oh, in the 180s. Oh. Yeah, um, so let me get back to, um, all right. All right, so not only are Russian women like the best cigarette rollers in the world, look at her. Isn't she amazing? They have brands entirely for women in the 19th century. They have um, dessert, because they're sweet cigarettes. They have, this is, I, I mean, if you see, these are the same brand. They have a male and a female, and it's almost the exact same pose that women can get the exact same things out of cigarettes as men. I mean, it's liberating. Uh, and so women are smoking a lot, and we also know women are smoking a lot because, okay, you have a lovely museum here, the Spencer, and they have a nice little exhibit of Fabergé pieces. You know the biggest thing that Fabergé made? cigarette cases, and he made them gorgeously. Lady cigarette cases in mauve and pink with little additional cigarette holders to go with them. He was a huge proponent of these kind of everyday luxuries, cigarette cases and picture frames. Those are his two biggest um, production items. And so it's no surprise here, I do have, I have one more set of visual aids. Um, it's no surprise, given how crappy those cigarette boxes are, that cigarette cases continue on through the Soviet experience. And another thing that connects with the military, because a lot of times these were made from shell casings um, as part of, and these are both commemorative of World War II, the 40-year anniversary. And so the cigarette case kind of brings that together. But women still smoke, and smoke, Urban women smoke more. Women start to smoke in higher numbers after 91. Marketers particularly go after young girls. Yeah, and with those slims, with the idea it's a way to um, um, lose weight um, and to be more feminine. Um, but there are images of beautiful smoking in Cirque. She, she's a foreigner, but oh my god, supposedly a foreigner. She smokes this gorgeous long cigarette holder, and she's looking at all of her gorgeous dresses and smoking and looking amazingly bereft after her lover has left. I mean, it's just, they, they use these same images, the same idea of smoking as a sexually liberating and beautiful process for women, but women just don't smoke in the same numbers. We had the... Um, 
I have a little bit of female smoking here in the late 1920s. I mean, you get a little bit, but you see that for the most part, when tobacco isn't available, women give it up for the men. And since supply is a problem, it's often the men get. <laughs> I don't know that that's a great gift, but it is what they do. So, yes. I don't, uh oh. I, I, I don't want to uh, sidetrack you, but I'm curious do they have any tobacco subcultures like uh, here in the States with chew? Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm wondering if they have anything like that at all or had before. Yeah, they do. Um, there's two that come to mind immediately. The water pipe um, is, um, they have the water pipe in War and Peace. They talk about the Nargle. Um, and they think it's healthier because it has to go through. It's not healthier. Um, but they think it's healthier. And so there's that kind of Central Asian water pipe. There's also something called Nasa or Nas. It's like a, a cha kind of tobacco that they use, yeah, in Central Asia. I do not get into the Central Asian tobacco use. I stay with smoking because it's the most addictive and I'm into whatever is going to kill more people. <laughs> and stopping it, and stopping it. <laughs> So, but. oh yes. Hi there. First off, really enjoyed that. Oh, thank you. Um, Don't smoke. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, so I was wondering about in modern Russia if alternative nicotine products have caught on, like vaping or vaporizers, yeah. pouches like Zins, gum, patches, and if that's made or part of the reason for. Um, the sharp decline. Of smoking. Right. Yeah, uh, it, there has been a. So the Russian anti tobacco laws have been really, really very stringent on not going after the smoker, but after establishments. And so the business gets fined if you're smoking there, which makes it better enforceable. You know, if people are more interested in enforce it. If the restaurant owner is going to be fined, they don't let you smoke. Whereas if you're going to be fined, you tend to. Yeah. And so they've been very good at that. Vaping has had caught on last I was there. But overall smoking prevalence, according to the Ro Russian Longitudinal Monitoring Survey, has gone down precipitously. And this is seen as a fairly reliable survey of people's usage. Um, it's a self-reporting data set. Um, but there has been a movement towards those vaping products and others. But overall, those are also somewhat regulated. And so people have gone down. It, access is part of it, just not being, able to, not being able to smoke easily at work. That said, last time I was at Garf, oh, years ago, um, the time before that, the, there was no smoking. The time after that, these same laws were in place, but I could smell it in places. So people were sneaking cigarettes and kind of breaking the law. So it is that kind of same thing of, it used to be the, the smoking room in the Leninka library was just papered with 1930s anti-tobacco <laughs> posters. And so that idea of smoking in front of the anti-smoking sign is still going on. And so that way to thumb it to the man. Okay, well, please join me in thanking Dr. Tricia Starks for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.